Moderating this morning's business huddle, we're pleased to welcome a gentleman known to everyone at NMSDC, Shelly A. Stewart, Jr. Shelly has served as Vice Chair of NMSDC Board of Directors, and earlier this year, he was elected Chair of the Billion Dollar Roundtable. Recently retired as CPO and Vice President of Sourcing and Logistics for DuPont, he now leads Bottom Line Advisory LLC, a boutique consulting firm focused on procurement operation improvement. Please welcome Shelly A. Stewart, Jr., who will introduce today's guests. Good morning. You guys awake? Good morning. Hey, listen, I'm retired and I'm here, so I know you all need to speak up, all right? Otherwise, I'm going to go back to the golf course. Listen, um, I've been asked to um, be the uh, moderator for a panel of uh, diverse suppliers, which is it's, it's fabulous for me because it's what, uh, now that I am a diverse supplier, I actually understand it even better, right? And so I'm going to ask them to come out. Can you guys all come out? Ann, Sid, Leon, Rosa. Okay, so let me uh, take my seat here. So the objective of this, this morning is for you all to learn something. Um, and we have a distinguished panel here, people that run their own businesses and run it, run it very well. <coughs> so I'm gonna ask them to take one minute and describe their business. One minute, describe <laughs> your business. I'm gonna start with you, Rosa. Good morning. So uh, I'm Rosa Santana, the CEO and uh, founder of Santana Group. And the Santana Group is a group of companies that are, we provide outsourcing solutions, anywhere from staffing, contact center, and assembly and manufacturing services. So good morning, my name is Leon Richardson. I'm the president and CEO of the Chemical Group. We're basically a chemical manufacturing company, but we provide chemical management services. Quite frankly, we're the largest African-American chemical management company in the world. We supply services in, thank you. We supply services and goods in 28 states and three countries. Thank you. Good morning, you all, and welcome to the National Minority Supply Development Council's 2019 Annual Conference and Panel Discussion. My name is Ann Ramakumaran, and I'm the founder and CEO of AMCIS. We're a global business and a technology consulting and a staff augmentation firm with our headquarters in Chantilly, Virginia, global delivery centers, innovation labs, and six customer support offices in the US. And what we do is support 60 of the Fortune 100, Fortune 1000 corporations in their business, technology, and finance transformation journey by backing it with uh, cybersecurity. Proud to be here. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I get an opportunity to reintroduce myself again. We <laughs> spoke about VDART. But I'm, my name is Sid, uh, and I'm president and CEO of VDART Inc. Founded the company in 2007. We are a digital talent management firm. We have it's VDART Group. Um, in the last 11 years, we've grown to about 2,500 people globally. We operate out of US, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Europe specifically, in Belgium and the UK. Um, all of us, all of the uh, back office operation uh, is provided from India. We, our newest addition is Japan and Australia. Um, in terms of uh, the services what we provide, we have digital talent management. We have a solution firm which is called as VDOR Digital. We have a product on blockchain uh, which is called as Vouch and V Validate, which is for uh, fraudulent documentation uh, authentication. Well, thank, thank you, you all for introducing yourselves. So, Anne, I'm going to start with you for the first question. So, unlike me, who took the corporate route, you became an entrepreneur. Why did you choose to become an entrepreneur versus doing something else, working in a big corporation? Um, talk a little bit about that. Sure, Shelly, great question. So in 2004, Shelly, what I noticed was, um, you know, a lot of the corporations were putting policies and processes in place to make sure that the spend with diverse suppliers increased. But at the same time, what they were looking for was suppliers that could be the one shop stop, if you may. What we noticed then was there were a lot of uh, diverse businesses that either specialized in providing technology services or focused on business consulting or focused on staff augmentation services, but there weren't too many that existed that understood some of the complex business problems and bridged the gap by infusing innovative technology solution and bring those projects to finish line 
by staff augmentation and hence felt the need to be that one shop stop and I'm glad we started that in 2004. Today we're supporting, you know, like I mentioned, uh, Fortune 100, Fortune 1000 corporations directly as a prime and we also support managed service providers and their staff augmentation journey. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, so the journey so far for the last 15 years has been great. For the last four years, um, all our growth has been organic, uh, but we infused in organic growth through three acquisitions. Um, and I'm glad, um, you know, we're always on the lookout for some of those positive disruptors because it's so important uh, to be that, you know, to be look, looking out for some of the positive disruptors in order to be relevant um, and most importantly, uh, to help customers navigate through some of their um, business and technology challenges. Thank you. Leon, how about you on that same question? Yeah, it's really interesting. I started my career out as a technician in a research laboratory, and uh, what, what I noticed, the companies that I was working for really put a great emphasis on moving or selling as much chemistry as they possibly could, and, and I thought we could look at it a bit differently. I thought we could come up with some innovative chemistries that reduce the toxicity that employees were exposed to, reduce the type of chemistry that was being used and control the overall cost. And, and our mission was to eliminate the use of some of these chemistries and that was not the goal of my current employers. So we left that industry to uh, go on our own and do just that, improve the environmental footprint, reduce the toxicity that employees are exposed to and control the overall cost. That, that's, that's, thank you for that. Um, Rosa, let me, um, so knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself when you started in, your, in, in business? So I would tell myself to do it all over again. <laughs> I definitely would start, you know, a business. Um, I think that one thing that I can say is that customers have seen in us, and I mean us because this is not in a one-person company uh, or group of companies. I have many very talented folks uh, that work with me. But what they've seen in us is something that maybe we didn't see in ourselves from the beginning. And uh, that's why my company has been very, very successful in entering new markets and doing other things besides the one thing that I thought I knew how to do best, which was staffing. Um, going into uh, a whole new different marketplace and a whole new different industry, the automotive industry, and becoming a, an assembler of truck beds and assembling 500 of those every day, not going into a different country to do that. And, you know, so I think really looking at yourself and thinking, how can I, you know, take what I know and what I've been successful at and, and apply it into different industries and different uh, types of uh, opportunities? Okay. Sid, um, I know all of you face obstacles in in your businesses, and what's, what's been some of the biggest obstacles you've faced in growing your business? Yeah, some of the obstacles I would say is um, talent. Um, as you continue to grow, A, first of all, I never came from um, a corporate background. I've never worked for a large employer. It's always been small businesses. So as a result of which, I did not have the experience of running large businesses at all. So technically, Every day is a challenge for us, okay? Um, it's a new set of challenges, whether it is people-related challenges, whether it is coaching and mentoring-related challenges, or whether it's a transformation challenge. So where we are heading towards right now is when we grew to about $20 million, at that point in time, it was just a few set of people. From there, our, t our leadership team, our core circle had to expand. We had to add more business leaders at that point in time. The fundamental mm -hmm. part is, do you have to grow leaders from within or you have to get talent from outside? Um, that's been a very, very complex puzzle to solve. Um, but fortunately, we had um, good mentors and coaches around us mm -hmm. who were able to walk us through. So people challenge is the, is the fundamental challenge, what I would say. But again, we had some great mentoring from Delta Airlines, again, specifically around leadership and with Accenture, which helped us maneuver through that. Well, I can tell you that uh, that challenge is the challenge that probably everyone in this room faces, whether you're in corporate America or you have your own business. The people challenge is one that is a constant challenge for all of us. What about uh, you, Anne? Uh, what, what were some of your biggest challenges? Yeah, so, so when I started off the business, obviously like any other entrepreneur, right, access to capital was an issue, but 
you know, as and when you continue to grow, that's no longer a challenge, right? But as you continue to build good relationships with your banks, make sure you have good line of credits and back, make sure that we're a zero debt company, which we are today. Um, but but to, to add to what Sid mentioned, right, when you're in, uh, when you're a solutions provider, when you're in staff augmentation, people truly, um, you know, getting the right talent and surrounding yourself with like-minded people who um, has that go-getter attitude and the entrepreneurial spirit uh, is very important. There are a lot of people out there um, who would probably have the technology experience as well as the industry experience, but it is so important to have that go-getter attitude and being passionate of considering your customer's problem as your own problem and helping them navigate through. So I think, uh, you know, as and when you continue to grow, uh, people uh, have continued to be one of those challenges, but we've navigated that through um, backing it up with acquisition, right. because with acquisition comes subject matter experts, with acquisition comes their projects, and with acquisition comes uh, their customers, so, yeah. Leon, yeah. I mean, it's a, I wanna ask everybody this question, because I think you all have, you know, a, a bookload of challenges that you dealt with, and do you have a different one other than people? Yeah, well, people is a challenge. Everyone has yeah. that. I mean, I, I compete with some of the largest corporations in the world for talent. So I'm competing with General Motors and Toyota and Honda. When they go to uh, recruitment programs at major universities, I'm standing right next to General Motors, and folks are saying, I'd rather go to General Motors than Chemical. So that becomes challenging. But also, uh, the, you know, we're, we're, we're a, a minority chemical company in an arena that we don't have a lot of companies that look like us. So we don't get the same type of opportunities. We have to work really hard to give our, have our customers give us the opportunities that they may give a Dow or a DuPont or a PPG. Even though we think we are as good, if not better, it's extremely difficult getting the right type of exposure, getting the right type of opportunity, and uh, that's probably been one of our largest challenges. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a high-risk business too, right? So It is a high-risk business, but we're uh, very good at it. The, oh, I, I know you are. <laughs> he's not bashful, right? That's why he's successful, right? Rosa, same thing, what, what challenge do you, you think? So, for us it's twofold, right? Uh, I think the talent, you know, uh, issue is a, is a global issue for so many of us, and being in the talent business, obviously very, very difficult to, to meet all of our customer demands, right? But also access to capital. So, um, when we first started, it was a, I started in a joint venture partnership, and, mm -hmm. and my joint venture partner was the one with the money. I was the one with the knowledge, the connections, the, the expertise, and uh, you know, for whatever reasons, we split up, and so the money's gone, right? And all of a sudden, all the banks are looking at you like, ah, you know, you're in a very uh, challenging industry. The staffing industry is not one that we bank, and so uh, non-traditional financing options were what we had to look at. And you know, you do what you have to do to stay in business today. It's, we're in a very different situation. Everybody, including all the big banks that wouldn't even look at us yeah. at that time, yeah. want to do business with us. So it's a great place to be today, but it was very challenging at the beginning. Certainly. So, um, you know, in this economic climate, you know, I've worked for some big companies that have gone through a lot of changes, and that tends to impact our supplier community, right? So uh, given the economy now is pretty good, there's always a question of what's going to happen next, how are you thinking about if the economy starts to decline? Are you prepared, Sid, to, to respond to that? Sure, absolutely. Um, yesterday, um, or, or on Friday, uh, State of the Minority Business, um, the State of the Minority Business Report, which they reveal about the looming economy ahead. Mm -hmm. Recession is definitely evident. It's a very interesting report uh, by uh, Dr. Danny from Georgia Tech. Um, so U.S. is the only um, economy which is pulling it through right now, and there are some um, anomalies or outliers, which is Japan, India, everywhere else, it is a looming economy. Now, the way we look, it was very interesting to go through that because from our board recommendation, just about a quarter ago, uh, we were thinking about, and the recommendation was, uh, Japan is a market to penetrate in. So the way we are looking at it is we, we obviously know that this is coming. So what we are doing is we are looking within our customer bases because our customers are the ones who have taken us global. Uh, all the locations, what I mentioned, where we operate, we did not just go out and open an office. 
It is our customers' need out there as a result of which we went and opened this facility out there. Now, what we are looking at is within our customer bases, who are those customers who would be able to um, extend opportunities for us where um, the countries which are thriving or are going to be thriving during recession. Also, the business model in which we are in, specifically VDART, um, we have balanced it in such a way, it was intentionally designed in such a way that whether it's a good economy or a bad economy, we will continue to thrive. Um, that's the reason why from 2007, when we started the business, 2008, 2009, 2010, we continued to post three-digit growth. So A, it is the business model, and secondly, you want to be intentional now about which countries, looking at your customer base, and which countries you want to go to. So you're a recession-proof guy, huh? Knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but you that's, know, I, but that's but, so true. Ahead, uh, that's, yeah. that's so true, Sid, because I think, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, Shelly, the brutal fact is it's coming, right? And I think as entrepreneurs, we've got to be optimistic because, um, you know, I'm sure many of the businesses have seen the economic downturn in 2008. We've gone through that, but I think we navigated through even during that phase and continue to grow because uh, it is so important to be ready. If you're part of some of those complex projects which require, which forces corporations, you know, to have you as a supplier to ensure that there's business con continuity, then no matter what, yep. whether the it's, it's good times or bad times, they would want you to be there and you continue to be that supplier of choice. Um, and, and to entrepreneurs out there, it's important that we are ready, but at the same time, there, you would see that there would be many suppliers uh, who would freak out. The very thought of recession would scare them. But you got to look at it as an opportunity. You may want to go ahead and acquire them if they have plans to exit out. So I think, you know, uh, be it government shutdown, again, we, we face that as well, uh, Shelley, because, you know, we do a lot of our, we, you know, 40% of our revenue is also generated by supporting federal agencies. But when you become part of some of the mission critical projects, even if there's a government shutdown, your projects, you know, your resources would continue to be part of that mission critical project. So I think it's important uh, to one, be ready, but at the same time, be part of some of the mission critical projects which would force this. Well, well, good. So Shelly, we started in 1989. If you go back and look, we were in a recession when we started. So we, we've always been in a recession. We've always operated as though it could come crashing down tomorrow. And, and we really focus on what, and, and, at, we think these kind of recessions impact our customers more than they impact us. So we look at our customers when they start to pull back on things they can do or things they no longer want to do but still are required, that's when we run into fine opportunities. At the beginning of the year, we looked in the automotive industry and large organizations like General Motors, as an example, said they're gonna reduce their workforce by 22, 23%, and they're gonna do it in 30 days. It is, if you're in manufacturing, you can reduce your workforce as rapidly as you want, but you can't reduce the task. Those tasks are still required. And you're gonna look for people to perform those tasks for you. We are one of those task masters. So we look for opportunities to, where our customers no longer can or want to do those things, even if it's, a, if it's in a recession, and, and we take advantage of that. You know, as I asked that question, I realize we often talk about um, smaller businesses be more nimble. nimble. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think that's the truth, too, right? You guys are, you know, I've worked for big companies, like DuPont was the last company I worked for. I spent almost 20 years at United Technologies. It's hard to turn the battleship. And the, the key for you all is to be nimble, right? And yep. I, I think that's, is, that's, what you, that's what you just said. That's what I just heard. That's I hope right. everyone else heard it. Rosa, question for you. Yes. Um, my dad owned a, a, a minority business, so I know how precious it, precious it was for him. And um, when you think about succession planning, who's, yes. how do you think about that, right? You're not, you want to retire someday, don't you? Um, I'm not sure that I'll ever completely <laughs> retire, but I want to have a job like but yours. You can, where you're so you busy feel like I after retirement, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, unexpectedly, really, I've prepared for um, a succession, right? I have two daughters that are in business with me. Uh, one of them is here somewhere out there. Uh, and, <laughs> yes, and uh, I think what's really, really important is that we prepare um, those successors, right? In my case, those two daughters of mine. Um, it's not been easy, I'll be frank with you. We butt heads a lot. We laugh, we cry, we, you know, get excited about all of the great things that we do. 
but at the end, you know, they're still my daughters and they still work for me. And, and as we're building, you know, the future for ourselves, I think the important thing is that now we're doing all of the financial and the, uh, the planning, right, for when I do exit, because I'm gonna exit in one, in one of two ways, right? I'm either gonna croak working because I love to work myself to death, or I'm going to retire and have a life like yours, Shelley, right? Yeah, so, you'd be sitting on the stage when I should be at a golf course. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So I think what's really important is to, you know, start looking at how do you start transferring some of your assets, right, to your children. So I've gone through that very painful process of looking at how do we do this, and uh, and it's working well. I think. Uh, we're all maturing in the business. We all kind of started the business together. So uh, it's very interesting and, uh, and we're, uh, you know, way along in the way uh, to this, so. Sid, 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 Sid wants to go, then we'll let you go. Yeah, so he's excited about, about this yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> he must have a good succession plan, okay? Succession <laughs> planning, so small business background, no idea about what succession planning is. I got to know only about like four years, three years ago. I'll, I'll quickly cover that, but prior to that, um, the fundamental reason why I started this company is so that we can create wealth generation opportunities for our employees. And, you, has, uh, and you'd seen it in um, what uh, David Abney had spoken as well. UPS was created for a particular reason so that it can create, the, the owner can make a buck, but it's more important to spread the wealth for your people and create yeah. wealth generation for your employees. And that's a fundamental reason why I started the company. And that's one of the reasons why, if you see, if the, the Tuck and the Kellogg's business programs, it's predominantly for entrepreneurs, but I've had my entire leadership team every year attend because I want every individual in the organization to think like an entrepreneur because they are going to be the next CEO of this company mm -hmm. or they are the next going to be the next EVP or they are the ones who are going to be running this organization. But more so on the, on the success. So they are the ones who are going to be running this organization. That's the way I look and believe in it. Um, having said that, Three years ago, when, we went, when I was chosen as fortunate to be uh, or worthy, award worthy to be an entrepreneur of the year for the Southeast region, as a result of which, when I, was, when I went through this uh, event, uh, which is called as a strategic growth forum, they have this program which is called as uh, the next gen entrepreneur. So your children are coached to become business owners over a period of time because your children might want to become doctors, engineers, whatever, they never want to become an entrepreneur. but something happens and if the family wants to take over the business and run it at a very high level then you could still have your kids so as a result of which my daughter who is like she, she's just in uh, at that time she's just joined college and she had attended the first year and the second year of the program it's a three-step program where they eventually uh, get an opportunity to take over the business or run the business at a very high level but it's people business it's our employees it's our people who are going to run this business that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Shelly's really interesting, and I, I really appreciate uh, Rose and her family wanted to be involved, and, and, and family being involved is a, a wonderful way to do it. Didn't work for me. <laughs> uh, so I have four daughters and one son, and I thought it was really important to explain to them how the business worked, explain to them what succession planning looks like, and explain to them what the estate plan looks like, and the estate plan is plan B. Plan A is you come in and run the company, but they've seen me work day and night. They've seen me start this company from scratch, I still own 100% of it. They see me grow at the level that we are today, which means I'm working day and night. They chose plan B. They said they'll wait me out. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've done is bring our management team into play and slowly started um, offering equity to our senior managers and uh, our CFO and uh, two or three of our vice presidents will end up creating ESOP and uh, be part of our success so, plan. So just for the audience, you've heard, this is an important topic and you've heard everybody approaching it differently. If you're an M business out here, MBE, you need to think about this. this. You can't wait till it's too late, right? Because it, it, be, it may be too late tomorrow, right? So I got a question for you, Rosa. Um, how do you, and this is for you too, Leon, how do you support other MBEs in your business? What are you guys doing to help the, the crowd out here? So do you want to go first, Leon? Sure. Uh, so. Uh, we all do a lot to help other MBEs, from Corporate Plus to being involved with the MBIC or the National Minority Business Development Council. But uh, our company, again, we operate in three different countries, and we are fortunate to win a, a large contract in Mexico. And I had never been to this area, and when we won the contract, they said, you have to go down and staff it in a month. I've <laughs> never been there, and I don't speak Spanish, and I had to fly down on my own. So I did, and we found a large staffing company, a Mexican staffing company that can help me, and my entire team said, let's go with that staffing company. 
Well, it's really interesting when you have Mexican staff because they, they actually participate in your profits. And when they leave the company, they actually get a severance package, which is equal to look, the amount of time they've been there. So we brought this staffing company in, and every single month we would get burned by our employees and burned by the staffing company. We let that staffing company go, and Rosa came and said, I can help you. My entire team said, no, she's too small. Okay, but with another staffing company, large company in Mexico, we got burned again three months later. I said, let's go with Rosa. They said, no, she's too small. We went through this three or four times, and I said, guys, we're going with Rosa. <laughs> and we haven't been burned in 10 years. I think eight years. It's been eight an amazing years. program. Yeah, that's amazing. Right. So, she, so tell them. Yes. So similar to, to what Leon is, is talking about, um, we do the same thing, right? We provide those type of opportunities for other MBEs, WBEs. And, and it's important for us to do that. Uh, I can tell you that anything that we purchase, we go to MBEs first and WBEs first. Everything that we purchase. Uh, I can tell you that we don't uh, have the privilege of selecting some of the parts that we purchase because they're predetermined by our clients. However, when we do have the opportunity to do that and to to look for new suppliers, we first look at MBEs and WBEs. And I always say this to every MBE that I mentor, that I help, is we can't expect corporations to help us if we're not willing to help ourselves, right? I talk about, you know, the money is green. The money is green wherever it comes from, from a, you know, a tier three supplier, tier two supplier, if you, you know, from an OEM, it doesn't matter. We still make a profit. And so I think one of the ways to really help each other is to provide an opportunity to show and to bring them onto the supply chains of the customers. It's a lot easier when you've been able to provide that opportunity to introduce them to your tier one or to your, or to your OEM and say, this is the company that helps me in our case that helps us staff uh, Chemico in Mexico. And so this relationship that uh, uh, Leon uh, is talking about is a, is a great relationship and a great example of how we have been able to deliver. Even though we were very small at that time in Mexico, we were able to deliver. We did much more because we were very nimble and because we're, we, we want to do great for not just him, but his customer, because one day that customer could become my customer as well. I didn't know how small, but thank God you were there for us because it really no. worked out well. Yes, thank that, you. That's wonderful. Let me, let me, so, what advice would you give uh, to young entrepreneurs, Anne? Yes, yeah, so to all the entrepreneurs, I've, I did um, you know, have the privilege of meeting some of the uh, startups as well as some of the um, newly certified MBEs uh, who are here this morning. So first of all, congratulations on being yeah. here. Um, I must say this is the right place um, because we've been certified by uh, CRMSDC, which is a NMSDC Regional Council in Virginia, Maryland, DC for over 10 years now. Um, and all that I want to say is look around. There's so many successful MBEs out here. You just heard Rosa and Leon say about their success story. And look around in the room. There are so many corporate members out here who have the right mindset. They're not here because they just want to go and check a box. They really want to see each one of you succeed, not just within the organization, but within in the marketplace as well. And corporations have been very supportive, um, you know, very supportive to all MBEs and other diverse businesses. Um, they have been very supportive, even in our case, they've helped us to continue to grow, not just regionally, but have taken us nationally, and not just nationally, but have taken us globally as well. So understand the power of this network. There are about 12,000 plus certified MBEs in this network. You'll get to meet over 6,000 plus attendees, which is a perfect combination of MBEs, corporate members, and agencies from you know, nonprofits as well as other federal and state and local agencies. So continue to network with one another, right? Stay engaged, be active, and most importantly, do not forget those who support you. Very important, believe me, business will come, right? But do not forget those who support you because be innovative, and if you continue to innovate and stay relevant and continue to do well, believe me, the best will follow. So support those who support you. And MSDC has supported us in our journey, and there are other advocacy organizations that has helped us in our journey, and that's the reason why we're here taking leadership roles, uh, supporting uh, this organization, which has been in existence since 1972. Sid, you want to? So um, 
a, a, a couple of quick nuggets for um, young entrepreneurs. Um, just wanted to, mentoring and help are the two main areas which I'm going to talk, talk about. Um, this morning we saw the video which is Welcome to Atlanta. All right, uh, Welcome to Atlanta is, um, is one of my mentees. He's a young entrepreneur, a young kid. His name is Rafi. You should, when you say, when you reach out to him, say hi to him. Um, he reached out to me stating that, hey, I would like to start this business. How do I, how do I approach this? Right? right from incorporation to giving a structure of the business, giving the ideas about how you can scale this business, giving bus uh, talking about how do you set up a business plan, how do you scale. That is the amount of time which an entrepreneur, successful entrepreneurs like us need to invent, uh, invest. Um, the second thing is, again, there is another story about we do a particular, I have a podcast which is called as uh, Tales from Trichy. Uh, this is, again, a young UGA grad comes up to me, he says, and I wanted to write a book, and this was a shadow writer whom I wanted to hire. Um, he, he was a rising senior. He came up to me and he said, hey, you know what? Hey, I think we can get you into a podcast, and that's what I want to do. So we immediately gave him the idea, got them all the equipment. Now they are running a successful podcast company. Right. So how is it that you can seed the thoughts into young entrepreneurs and give some structure for growth? So mentoring and help, those are the two key things, what I would say. So we're going to close this up, but I quick story. So you, you all know that I worked in corporate America for a long time, the five corporations. So I opened up my bottom line advisory LLC. I got business right away with a big corporation. And the advice I didn't get from you guys is what to do with that 40 page set of terms and conditions. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I did this to people all my life. Now they're doing it to me. And hey, listen, let's give this group a round of applause, will you? Thank, <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you.